Welcome to part two of Messianic Jews. Are they a Trojan horse for the Christian church? Now, as I said in part one, uh, this is going to be part two, as I said in part one, a lot of the things that they say and teach, I'm in agreement with. But, as I often heard Kent Hovind say, Rat poison is 99% good food and 1% poison. Well, I kind of wonder if maybe that's what Messianic Judaism is. Now, I admit I'm against Easter and I'm against Christmas, Xmas, whatever. Um, I think we should... Uh, you know, if you, if you want to keep the Sabbath, that's great. I'm not a very good Sabbath keeper, but um, those are the days I usually try to do my Bible studies for you. And, um, you know, uh, honoring the day of the Lord's Supper, I think that's great, you know. Um, is it a requis uh, prerequisite for salvation? Absolutely not. In... Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus was speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the copyists of the law, the Torah, as you will. They were the ones that hand wrote the Bible on scrolls, animal skins. And the Pharisees were a denomination of Jews. They were the largest denomination of Jews. Paul said he was a Pharisee, the straightest sect of the Jews. Now, not all Jews are Pharisees, but all Pharisees are Jews. I've said that many, 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 many times. Please understand, if you're a regular listener, um, sometimes I make studies for new people, and they may not necessarily know. So, uh, yeah, it sounds like I repeat myself an awful lot. But in Matthew 23, 23, listen to this. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone, doesn't that sound like Messianic Judaism today? I don't hear a lot about faith and salvation in Christ and mercy and judgment. I don't hear that. What do you hear? Tithing, Sabbath-keeping, feasts, Shemitahs, blood moons. Let's face it, people. It's all about works. Those are the things that I hear from the Hebrew Roots people and the Messianic Jews. Let me read you a short thing that I read one time from a uh, comment. I don't know who wrote this. I, I, you know. Somebody on the Hebrew Roots, uh, one of their websites wrote the following. I would bless anyone who said, quote, Jesus is Lord, unquote. My note. The Messianics seemed to refuse to use the name of Jesus, and the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. Yeshua appears nowhere in the New Testament. That's the end of my note. So, I would bless anyone who said Jesus is Lord. If a person is so steeped in their own culture so much that they can't even return a greeting of Jesus Christ be with you, then I have some problems. I've listened to Mark Billets, Jonathan Burnus, Sid Roth, Charles Staley, Jonathan the Khan, Perry Stone, and others. I don't hear a lot about salvation through Christ. I mostly hear a lot about temple ornaments, obscure feasts, and blood moons. I believed, as you do, that they were honestly honoring Christ with faith and works. 
but a lot of them have serious problems with the New Testament. And that's the end of the uh, thing. You know what? I see that too. They have a lot of problems with the Old Testament. A lot. What did Jesus say? You know, uh, they're always about, they say, oh, we got to keep the law. We got to keep the law. We got to keep the law. And they're so quick to point out the deficiencies of the church. Oh, they changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And, uh, oh, they keep Easter and they keep Xmas. And, you know, Jeremiah 10 says, don't decorate a tree. And they keep Christmas and all this and blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, you're right. But do they ever warn you about the Jews that practice Kabbalah, which is Satanism masquerading as witch? It's witchcraft masquerading and Satanism masquerading as Judaism. Do they ever warn you about that? No. Do they ever warn you when the Zionist, the atheistic Zionistic Israelis bomb and murder and kill women and children and Christian Palestinians? No, of course not. They never tell you about that. Do they ever tell you about the rabbis that are spreading herpes to newborns because they perform circumcisions on the newborns and then suck the baby's penis with their mouth to get the blood? Do they ever tell you about that? No. But, but they're quick to point out, oh, uh, you know, uh, oh, the Christian church celebrates Easter egg hunts, you know. And by the way, if you don't know what I'm talking about with the rabbis sucking the baby's penis with their mouth after they circumcise them to get the blood, type in rabbi oral suction. And don't go to new uh, USA news source. Go to an Israeli news source and read about it. They call it oral suction. They got a special word for it. Um, they got two different words that they call it. How come the Messianic Jews never tell us about that sick practice? You see, the, my opinion is... Um, how do I put this? Um, if you were in the Navy and you had a big, what they call a capital ship, like in World War II, the capital ships was the aircraft carrier. That was the queen. Like if you were playing chess, that was the queen, the queen of the fleet. So what you would do is you take all the little ships and put the little ships around it so that if there was a submarine and it sent a torpedo in, chances are it would hit one of the little ships and sink it and not hit the big aircraft carrier, which was your most important piece. You know, the queen is your most important piece on a chess set. Um, guys get this stuff. The girls, not so much. Uh, if you were playing football, um, you got the guy that's holding the ball that's running, and you'd have other guys around in front of him who would block off the other team. That's what you call running interference. You have people around you to protect the one, okay? Well, personally, I think Messianic Jews are running interference for the Zionists. They never, they never warn, I've never heard, not one Messianic Jew ever say one word against the Kabbalah. I've heard them say, well, we don't practice Kabbalah. I've heard them say that. Well, you know, I, I don't practice sacrificing children on an altar to Satan. I mean, you know, but I expose, I expose wickedness. I try to, you know, and I'm not perfect. I've got a lot of my own faults. I mean, you know, let's face it. But the thing is, Messianic Jews never expose the wickedness. And, and you would think that the, the Palestinians being murdered are the worst monsters in the world. I mean, you, you would really think so. I mean, they never, they, they, they never say a word. And 
between 15 to 30 percent of the Palestinians are Christians. And they're being murdered. How come the Messianic Jews never raise a voice in protest for them or warn the, the Christian church? Maybe it's because they're not. My opinion is they, when the, when the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the Antichrist, by whatever name, they go by several different names in the, in the Bible, I think they're going to proclaim to the Christian church, even Christ has come. And let me tell you people, the pre-trib rapture people are all expecting Jesus to come back first. They are expecting Christ, not the Antichrist. They are expecting Christ to come. And let's face it, people. The church practically worships the Jews. Not the king of the Jews, not Jesus, who is Christ, the king of the Jews, but they worship the Jews. I've heard all kinds of heresies, and I'm sure you have too. I mean, I've heard, I think it was John Hagee said that uh, Jews get saved without Jesus. That's not what the Bible teaches. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. That's what the Bible says. John Hagee says, now nah, that's, that's for the church. So, let's take a look at some scriptures. Now, this is the crucifixion. John 19, 29. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it, up, and put it, put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's, being, he's crucified. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day. I'm thinking it was probably, maybe, maybe it was the Passover. Besought Pilate, that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. In other words, they wanted to break their legs so that they would die quicker. You know, when you're hanging on the cross, uh, you could use your legs to keep pushing yourself up so that you could breathe. Because when you're hanging from the cross, I mean, it, it was constricting your lungs and you couldn't breathe. So you would use your legs to push yourself up, breathe, and then you could relax and then, you know, do it again. But if your legs were broken, forget it. Uh, you could, it would be much harder to breathe and you would die quicker. So, verse 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, remember Joseph of Arimathea? Let's take a look at him real quick. All right, uh, let's see. John 19.38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, 
which at the first came to Jesus by night, might by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is, to bury. Uh, let's see. So, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came and buried and took Jesus, right? Well, Nicodemus was an interesting character. Let's go to John chapter 3 and verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees, denomination of the Jews, right? Named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. Why? He didn't want to be seen. But yet he was curious. He was interested, right? The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, being born again, right? So, what's Nicodemus thinking? Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's thinking of the physical, the flesh. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. You know, it's an interesting word is wind. It's from a Greek word, pneuma. And... Um, Guys will probably, a lot of guys will know this, but um, you've heard of pneumatic tools, air tools. You know, if you're working in a, a water environment, a, a, a room with a lot of water around, uh, you'd want to use air tools, like a drill connected to a air hose under air pressure to operate the drill. You wouldn't want to use a drill that was, you know, with wires plugged into a wall. You know, an electric drill, that's dangerous in a water environment. Air tools. Uh, a lot of mechanic shops use air tools. Well, that's what the Greek word for wind is. Pneuma. It means air or wind. But it also means spirit. So, it, it's, it's a very interesting word word. Remember when in Genesis it said that God breathed into Adam the breath of life? Well, that's where it's along those lines. Now, in the Old Testament, that's the Hebrew. Whereas in the New Testament, you know, it's Greek. But it's along the same lines. Let's take a look at something. John chapter 20. I guess we'll start in verse 1. This is the resurrection. You know, what really bothers me about churches is they say they're fundamentalists. Well, you know what the fundamentals are? When you're in school, okay, the fundamentals are reading writing and arithmetic, okay? Art, music, that stuff is, it's good to be well-rounded and have a little knowledge, but is a knowledge of music or art 
imp that important? No, not really. You know, it really irked me. I went to college for two years. And out of 60-something credit hours, you might only have 9 or 12 credits in the field that you were studying. The rest of it was garbage. You know, I had to take music and all kinds of stupid classes. I mean, moronic stuff. Yeah, it's good to know history. It's good to know English. It's speech, things like that. Yeah, you know, but... What are the fundamentals? You know, if you go to a Baptist church, they, they say they're fundamentalists, but they're not. Dispensational theology is not a fundamental doctrine. It's not believe on dispensational theology and thou shalt be saved. No. And dispensational theology is basically, you'll read something out of the Old Testament and say, well, that's not for the church, that's for the Jews. And then you'll read something, let's say Acts chapter 4, and you'll say, well, that's for the church, that's not for the Jews. And then, you know, you slice the Bible up in all these little time periods for different people. No, that's not an essential doctrine. The pre-trib rapture, is that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and the pre-trib rapture and thou shalt be saved? A lot of Baptist churches yeah, they actually believe that. You don't believe in the pre-trib rapture. You're not saved. I've had people say that. I'm beginning to think they're the ones that are not saved. But, you know, what are the, the, the essential doctrines? I mean, me, I believe the virgin birth, um, the life, sinless life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his faith in what he did. Those are the essential doctrines. Okay? Let's read John chapter 20, verse 1 real quick. The first day of the week cometh, Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. All right, John 20, verse 2. Um, so Mary Magdalene, okay. Uh, then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's John, I believe it's the same John that wrote the book of Revelation. Um, do you know, out of the twelve apostles, okay, Judas hung himself, so that meant there was eleven. Do you know that ten out of the eleven apostles all died for their faith? Yeah. The only one that didn't die of their, for their faith was John that wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, there might have been two Johns. I'm not sure. All right. Uh, then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped, stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, 
and I will take him away. You know, it's funny. She didn't recognize him, and she didn't recognize his voice. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Remember where it says, call no man father on the earth, and call no man rabbi? Rabbi means master. That's another thing. Messianic Jews will always tell you, oh, rabbi means teacher. No, it means master. And the only master we have is God the Father. Okay? So, we're... You're, and, and we're not... A matter of fact, let's go check that out real quick. All right, words of Christ. Matthew 23, verse 8. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Hmm. John 1, 38. Then Jesus turned and saw and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? Huh. So, you know, it tells you. Matthew 23, 8. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. How come all the Messianic Jew leaders call themselves rabbi when the Bible says not to? Okay? But if you point that out to them, guess what they'll do? Oh, well, you know, the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew, and what it really means is this, and then those pagan satanic Greeks mistranslated it, and it's all wrong. So, come listen to me, the rabbi, and I'm going to tell you what the Bible really means. Yeah. All right. John, chapter 20, verse 17. Um, or at 16. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. So, evidently, um, he hadn't quite yet had his glorified body from the resurrection. This would be a very interesting study in and of itself. But, the, you know, uh, every believer, when we're resurrected, we're going to have new bodies. And that, this is a, that would be a worthy study, like I say, in and of itself. But... It said Jesus hasn't been ascended. You know, it's funny. The New Age movement, and uh, those of you that used to watch uh, Stargate, SG-1, or whatever, um, Daniel Jackson became an ascended being. You know, when you die, your spirit goes off somewhere, and you go to a higher plane of existence and all that kind of garbage. Um they take Bible terminology and they fill your head with all kinds of unbiblical ideas. You know, the Bible teaches you either go to be with Christ or you go down to the other place. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and, they had spoken and, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad 
when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Remember I told you wind, pneuma? And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye, receive ye the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Numa, sometimes wind, sometimes spirit. You can't see the wind, but you can see what the wind's doing. Same thing with the Spirit of God. You know, uh, I've lived through hurricanes. You can't see the wind, but you can see that tree blowing or blowing around. You can see things flying through the air. You can see what the wind's doing. You can see what the Spirit's doing, too. You can't see the Spirit. Maybe one day, when we get our uh, glorified, resurrected bodies. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. You ever heard of remittance? That means uh, to pay. You know, you when you send your remittance to a a company for something you owe, you're you're paying them. It's like a bill, okay? And who whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. You don't want to retain your sins. You want to get rid of them. So basically, Christ is saying. Um, Whoever sins you are paid or paid, and whoever sins are not paid or not paid. And you definitely want to have your sins paid. But without Christ, your sins are not paid. They're retained. You don't want to retain your sins. You know, it's like women, um, you know, um, after they've had a kid, uh, they, they have that baby fat. They don't want to retain that. They want to get rid of it. Get their old body back, right? Girls can understand that. Uh, all right. So, that was the point about the wind. Let's go back. All right, let's go back to uh, Nicodemus. John chapter 3. Verse... Uh, let's start with verse 6 again. Yeah, verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of people don't know it. You, you know, um, you've heard the expression, a woman's water breaks. And that means the baby's coming, dude. You know, pregnant woman, the water breaks. That, it's coming. That's, that's when you're born of the water. And baptism, water baptism is sort of kind of a symbol of that, right? So, being born of the water, um, that's kind of like your physical birth. And then, you know, you got to be born of the Spirit for your spiritual birth, right? Except a man be born of water and of, the, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goest. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye received not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
Even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now there was a, Israel was in the desert. And um, I, I forget what book it is. And it might be in the book of Leviticus. I mean, not Leviticus. Maybe Exodus or maybe it's Numbers. I, I'm not sure. But it's in one of the books of Moses. Israel's in the wilderness. And the Lord was really PO'd, I guess you could say, with Israel. And um, he was angry. So he sent fiery flying serpents to bite the people. And Moses was instructed to make a serpent of brass and to lift it up into the wilderness. And all those people that looked upon the brass serpent that Moses lifted up would live. So this is what I don't understand. I, that's something I could, I just don't make the connection of, I wish I could tell you the deeper things of that, but I, I just, I don't get it, you know. I just don't get it. You know, this is why you need to read the Old Testament, because it ties in with the New. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16, probably the most famous. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And people... My Bible says his name is Jesus. And if you talk to a Greek who the New Testament was in their language, yes, it's changed over the 2,000 years, just like English has changed over the last 400 years. But if you ask them how to pronounce Jesus, they will say Jesus. Okay? I mean, I know Greeks. I know some Greeks. I always talk to them. And the reason they won't have fellowship with the Western so-called Christian church is because of, one of the reasons is the pre-trib rapture. Those idiots will argue with the Greek church, telling them, oh, you guys, you, you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture? You guys aren't even saved. The Greek church is the most persecuted church in the history of the world. They were the ones that went to Eastern Europe and spread the gospel. And they were murdered by the millions. And you're going to talk to them about the pre-trib rapture and tell them about all this stuff when they can read the, the New Testament in their own language? Are you idiots? That's why they have no fellowship with us. Well, I, not a, me necessarily. Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of them. I... I try to pick their brains. I, I try to talk to a lot of people um, and, and learn what I can. I, I'm not, you know, I try not to argue, uh, except for when people are into heresies. And I think the Hebrew roots and this Messianic Judaism is a heresy. But then again, so is, you know, the Bible says that Satan's deceived the whole world. And that includes me. I know that. But I'm trying to make as little as possible, if you know what I mean. All right, uh, John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know what? Let's read the entire chapter, John chapter 3. You know, John the Baptist was called the greatest of all those that were born of women by Jesus. How's that for a testimony? When Jesus says there was not a greater born of women than John the Baptist, you know, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Boy, I tell you what, 
Now, that's, that's a testimony right there, you know? All right, verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Did you ever notice that? People, um, criminals always operate in the dark, you know? People get mugged, generally not in the daytime. It's always at night, you know? And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Aenon, near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said to him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Oh yeah, you think you, think you can uh, understand something on your own? No way. The, the, the things that I do know about the Lord comes from the Lord. And the things that I don't know, he hasn't given to me. You know, there's a lot of things I know, but there's a lot of things I don't know. I, I remember the first year I got saved, I, all I did was just read, study the Bible. It's like 12, 14 hours, 16 hours a day. I mean, I'd be sitting at the table eating, reading. I, I just couldn't, you know, every time I had a question and was able to answer one question, I'd have two more. It was like that for quite a while. And, um, you know, it's just, the more I study, the more I realize how little I know. And I tell you what, there's some deep stuff that I want to get into. You know, but it's just so sad that most people have, I've heard that most people have an eight-second attention span. Yeah. How can you learn anything in the Bible in eight seconds? It takes you eight seconds to read John 3.16, for God so loved the world. I mean, you know, that's their attention span. John 3.16. Okay. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore it's fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. The seal of God. That's a very, that would be an interesting study. Would you rather have the seal of God or the mark of the beast? That's a no-brainer, huh? For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Think about that next time. A Jew, you're told that the Jews don't need the Son. Oh, they have an everlasting covenant with the Father. They don't need to be saved by Christ. 
that's not what John said. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. All right, John chapter 7 and verse 13. Howbeit no man spake openly of him, who? Jesus. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. You know, it's funny. The, um, there was that guy, what's his name? Rabbi Kaduri or Kaduri or whatever, K A D U R I. Yitzhak Kaduri. And he wrote Yeshua or something like that on a piece of paper. And all the church people are like falling all over themselves saying, oh, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. No, he wrote Yeshua. And Yeshua doesn't appear anywhere in the New Testament. Okay? What happens if the Antichrist calls himself Yeshua? Oh, matter of fact, the in the English, we pronounce it Joshua. There's a book in the Bible. It's a sixth book of the Bible in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Of course, the Jews have always got to spell it differently, and they've always got to pronounce it differently. You know, but um, it has reference to Savior or Salvation. But they always want to make you think they're talking about Jesus. Well, the thing is, Kaduri practiced Kabbalah. Kabbalah is about conjuring up spirits. Go to Chabad, C-H-A-B-A-D, and then type in, go to Google, type in Chabad, and then type in Kabbalah, K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H. Spend an hour reading. They believe in reincarnation. They don't quote the scriptures, the Torah, the Old Testament, they quote a book called the Zohar, which was written by a, a, a Jew. Well, Jesus said the synagogue of Satan, those that call themselves Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2.9, Revelation 3.9, words of Christ in red speaking. You know, it's Satanism and witchcraft masquerading as Judaism. And you'll never hear, I, I've just never heard a, a Messianic Jew condemn it openly. You know, I wanted so badly to believe that the Messianic Jews were real. Well, let's take a look. What did, what did Jesus say was required for salvation? Let's take a look at that. Those of you that listened to me for a while have heard this before, but it, you know, it's very important. Words of Christ. Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, and you're not talking about a lawyer like we got today. You're talking a lawyer that's a, a, a doctor of the law, of the Old Testament, the Bible, the scriptures. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, so he's trying to trick Jesus. And he's saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The two commandments, love the Lord, love thy neighbor. You don't need ten. Oh, you ever hear a Messianic Jew condemn the Noahide laws? The laws of the seven laws of Noah? No, never. Where are those in the scriptures? They're not. There's there nowhere in the Bible is there the laws that God gave to Noah. 
you read them on the surface, and if you read them with rose-colored glasses from a Christian mindset, the laws sound actually pretty good. But they weren't written by Christians. They were written by people that call themselves Jews, people that follow the Kabbalah. And the first commandment is not to blaspheme the Lord. Well, I tell you what. They claim that the greatest blasphemer that ever lived was Jesus because he claimed to be the Son of God, making himself equal with God. So, to a Kabbalah Jew that wrote the Noahide laws or follows them, you're a blasphemer if you believe in Jesus. And guess what the penalty is? Death. Method of execution? Beheading. Wow, where have we read that before? Uh, the book of Revelation. Didn't we? Oh, yeah. And that's in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years hmm all right Acts chapter 15 Remember how the um, Messianic Jews love to tell you, that, oh, well, you know, you need to keep the Sabbath and you need to do all these things, you know, and Shemitahs and Jubilees and Sabbaths and feast days and all this, you know, wear tassels and all this other junk, right? Acts 15, chapter 1. And certain men which came down from Judea, that was the land area where the Jews were, right? And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Oh yeah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be circumcised. That's how you become saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phineas and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, in this particular instance, I think these were actually true believers that were trying to honor God. I don't think these people were deceivers. I really don't. That's my opinion. I could be wrong because it says, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, okay, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this manner. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by, the by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. 
Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build up again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles whom, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain, abstain means staying away from, that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Don't be a vampire, okay? Stay away from idols. Stay away from fornication. Uh, don't strangle and kill your don't kill your animals by strangulation. And from blood, I think strangulation is a it's some kind of an occult practice, if memory serves me correctly. Verse twenty one. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then it ple then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barsabas and Silas, chief among the brethren. All right. Stay away from idols, fornication, things strangled, and don't be drinking blood. Okay? Uh, love the Lord, love thy neighbor, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Okay? That's, you know, that's, uh, that's basically, you know, that's it. You know, and, and the, the Messianic Jews will, and, and Hebrews people will love to blast Paul. Oh, he changed the law. He had he had no authority to do that. I mean, you know, in Acts 15, 11, we read, we just read, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. In Acts 16, 31, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Okay. In Acts 15, 29, continuation, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Acts 21, 25, as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing. Well, I guess we need to go back and read that. Otherwise, I'm reading out of context, right? All right. The uh, thing to answer that is uh, Acts 2121. 21. And they are informed of thee, Paul, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Paul didn't say not to circumcise. He just said it was not a requirement for salvation. Okay, you want to circumcise your kid, circumcise your kid. But there were Jews teaching that you had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be circumcised. Okay, Paul wasn't saying not to do it. He just said it wasn't nece uh, uh, necessary, you know, cutting a piece of skin off is not going to be the difference between whether you have your salvation or not, okay? Um, let's see. So, all right, yeah, and then we were, um, 
All right, go to verse Acts 21, verse 25. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, circumcision, okay? Save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, love the Lord, love thy neighbor, you know, stay away from idols, don't drink blood, stay don't stay stay away from things strangled and don't be messing around with your girlfriend if you're unmarried. Get married. You know? What can I tell you? That's it. That's you do all those things and you're doing well. According to the disciples and Paul. Now, this is Paul. The other times that I read these same type of things before was when the apostles were all there. Did the Holy Spirit, according to the scriptures, say that Paul was a false apostle, son of Satan? No. But there are Messianic Jews and Hebrew Roots people will tell you Paul's a false apostle. And yet, he was there with the apostles. Peter, Peter was right there with Paul. Was Peter told by the Holy Spirit, Paul's a false apostle, rebuking? No. You see, Hebrew roots people and Messianic Jews will, will flat out tell you the Bible is wrong. They will deny these scriptures. They will deny this. But they do it subtly. You know, this is why I don't trust them. I believe this King James Bible. I don't trust people that tell me that it's all wrong. I mean, read what Paul wrote in Romans 13 and verse 9. Now, this was the book of Romans. Um, Paul was in Rome. And the church that Paul was at in Rome was far different from what is in Rome today. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. That's what the Jews did uh, against Jesus before Pilate to have him put to death. They bore false witness against him. They broke one of the Ten Commandments. They didn't keep the Torah. Ooh. But you listen to the Hebrew roots and the Messianic Jews, and they'll tell you flat out, ooh, it was the Romans that killed Jesus. No, my Bible says it was the Jews. You see, they'll lie. I've had Messianic Jews tell me to my face that the Romans killed Jesus. No. I did an entire study on that. Matter of fact, that was the study I just did. It was the Jews that killed Jesus not the Romans. Pilate tried to release Jesus three times. So, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Galatians 5 and verse 14. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Book of James, chapter 2, verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Do you read anything in there about blood moons, jubilees, shemitahs? feast days, Sabbath keeping, circumcision? No. The Pharisees kept all those things, and yet they bore false witness against Jesus to have him put to death. Faith, people. That's what you need to have. Not jubilees, not shemitahs, not blood moons. Not temple ornaments. Here's an interesting thing. Acts 13 and verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. 
Even Pilate, in the trial of Jesus, knew that the Jews had delivered Jesus out of envy. They were envious. Jesus was performing all kinds of miracles. He healed the lame and, and gave sight to the blind. And, you know, I've read portions of the Talmud, which is the Jewish commentary of the law. You know, it's, the, it's basically the opinions of rabbis. There are some jewels in the Talmud, but it's like looking for a pearl in a pit of sewage. You know, you got to get your hands dirty. But even the Talmud, the rabbis that lived in the days of Christ, admit that he performed all kinds of miracles. But of course, they claim that he did his miracles by the power of the devil to deceive the Jews. But Pilate, he knew the Jews had delivered Jesus out of envy. Matter of fact, let's take a look at that real quick. And we'll go back to this. Okay, Book of Mark, 15 and verse 9. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will, will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests, not the Catholic priests, the Jewish priests, for he knew that the chief priests had delivered him, Jesus, had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. But the chief priests moved the people that they should rather release Barabbas unto them. Okay? And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said, said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. I mean, you know, envy people. Acts 13.45 But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And that's what they do today. They claim to believe in Yeshua, and they'll tell you that Paul is a false apostle. So they contradict Paul, and they blaspheme. Oh yes, you got to get circumcised. you got to keep Shemitahs, and Jubilees, and Sabbath, and feast days. Yeah. Acts 14, too. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. Hmm. Sounds like today, doesn't it? You know, have you ever noticed how anti-Christ the, the media is? I wonder who owns the media. There's an excellent article by a guy named um, Stein in the LA Times. He goes, come on, who runs Hollywood? Stein is Jewish, and the LA Times is a Jewish-owned newspaper, and he admits who runs Hollywood. And no, it's not the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's not Christians. And they are always stirring up everything against Christians. Did you ever notice all these occult movies? You know, somebody's possessed by a devil or a demon or whatever. And they always bring in a Catholic priest, and the Catholic priest can, can't do anything. That's telling, isn't it? How come they don't show the truth where the apostles used to go in and, and cast out the devils. I think that was the thing that Jesus cured the most, was uh, people of demonic possession, uh, casting out devils. 
I think that's the thing he, he, he cured the most. But you got the Catholic priest, goes in there, and he can't do nothing. Matter of fact, he gets his butt whipped and oftentimes ends up dead. Because they have no power, according to Hollywood. Acts 17, verse 5. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Mm. Very telling. Uh, let's see. How about Acts 18 and verse 12? And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, A-C-H-A-I-A, -A, the Jews made insurrection. That's a riot, okay? The Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. So here it is. The Jews are stirring up trouble, trying to get Paul in trouble. Okay? I mean, against Paul. And Paul was one of them. Paul was a Jew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He said he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, a very learned scholar in his day. Matter of fact, I've read some of Gamaliel's writings. Gamaliel is even quoted in the New Testament. Guy was a brilliant, brilliant scholar. I, I have respect for him. According to legend, he became a Christian. I don't know if it's true. I guess in the resurrection we'll find out, won't we? I'm going to close this out and make this the end of part two. Um, computer's getting wacky. All right. Um, wait up for part three.